Striker Scorpion 82 is now sponsored by Warhammer Combat Cards, a card battle game featuring your favourite Citadel miniatures from the 40k universe. Build your army decks, dominate opponents in player versus player action, collect and upgrade cards to fit your strategy, improve their power and unlock unique traits. Choose from all 40k factions, take part in campaigns based on iconic 40k battles, rise to the top of the leaderboard and win glory. Free to download and play, link is in the video description below or on the channel homepage and by using the unique link it helps support the channel. Thanks and enjoy the game. Right, welcome to this complete army video uh, for the channel. It's been a while since I've done one of these, uh, but it's for my Necron Force, uh, which has uh, now reached 2,000 points. An exciting time for the Necrons, but 85% of this new list here is the brand new models. So a lot of work, a lot of effort has gone into uh, an entire revamp for my uh, Necron army and an expansion in my collection as well. So it really helps with things like Apocalypse games uh, for uh, Necrons on the channel as well. But uh, in this video, I'm gonna run through my current list uh, which has been doing quite well as uh, and then we'll break down we'll, we'll talk about army strategy army build tactics all the units why the units have been chosen upgrades things like warlord traits uh, stratagems relics all of those kind of things been discussed here in this video give you an idea of, of how the entire army operates why each of the units has been chosen uh, and you're free to copy this list if you wish uh, or you can take elements of it Experiment, add them to your own list uh, for your Necron Army. But the idea of this video is just a complete army overview to give you an idea of how this 2,000 points Necron Army works. So it'll be a chance to see the army as well. Once we've gone through the list, I'll gradually build it up uh, and then we'll, we'll zoom out and I'll, I'll lay the whole army out so you get an idea of how the final army looks on the board. Uh, if you like the look of the Necrons, just mention the painting tutorial uh, that's available on the channel here. It's quite an older painting tutorial, but it's the same process I've used for all of the models, uh, the vehicles, um, any of the larger models, all the way down to Necron Warriors. It's exactly the same process. I cover basing on that video as well. So that's the Necron uh, painting tutorial. It's a few years old, but you'll find it uh, on the channel. So first of all, add the theme for the Necron army. So obviously it's like the soulless machine and really want to try and reflect that in this marching kind of legion. There's a semi hint of zombie un undead going on. So this kind of a relentless march uh, taking place to the Necrons. So I like the idea of lots of Necron warriors, really wanted that in the list. And, and then just kind of this, this unified army that marches forwards and nothing can stop it. That's the kind of theme that I wanted. And it's quite sort of scared, intimidating kind of theme. To go for as well. So that's what I've gone for with this Necron uh, force here. And then obviously you've got the new new codex now, which I think is a fantastic codex. Love using it as the models that Games Workshop have revamped has been incredible. They have done a brilliant job. The, the Necron Warriors, amazing models. Already had good models, but uh, the revamps they've done a fantastic new monoliths look great. Uh, the Canoptic Destroyers. The Locusts, uh, Heavy Destroy model, Hex Mark Destroy, all of these brand new models have been done. Uh, they've redone the Flayed ones, the new characters, the new Overlord, Warden, uh, and then of course uh, the the real centerpiece here, uh, the Silent King model, which is utterly incredible. So uh, congratulations to Games Workshop for producing some fantastic models. Really, really good. So. Uh, an exciting time. It's been the most exciting time to collect Necrons. I've noticed over the years, uh, in recent years, they kind of dropped off. They weren't as popular amongst uh, 40k players and then Games Workshop have revamped the Necrons and now they're a uh, very popular faction indeed. And obviously the Indomitus box set uh, it has been a great boost uh, to the popularity of Necrons as well. So with that in mind, I'm trying to build a Legion and the, the tactic really is that the army uh, is very resilient, so it will absorb damage and start to repair itself during the game, similar to tactics in previous armies over different editions. Uh, and then in that firefight that takes place, both, arm, both armies causing damage, the Necrons uh, outlast the opponent and then start to rebuild and they tip the scales of the game in their favour. Obviously in 9th edition you've got to be a bit quick, now you've got to move out quickly, grab objectives, hold ground. So uh, I need a Necron army that's not just going to be a defensive gun line. Uh, which I semi used to play that way with them. I need an army that's 
uh, happy to move out to the middle of the table and it's got to cope with things like close combat uh, going on against sometimes you know very close combat heavy armies but they've got to move out if you're going to play the game and try and win uh, I need a Necron force that's going to move out to the middle of the table and try and win in, in close range firefights mostly uh, so I need to bear that in mind in constructing this list so you're going to see a gun line a one that's going to relentlessly march forwards but there's going to be supporting units to help that gun line uh, move forward so some crucial unit choices uh, that has really helped this list do quite well in games so that just gives you an idea of, of the tactics and uh, if you're going to build a Necron army you've, you've got to for Ninth Edition you've got to be able to move out to the middle of the table uh, and aggressively claim objectives and so on otherwise you're not going to stand too much chance in the game you're just not going to score enough points so uh, I'll start in order here and maybe I will cover dynasties first of all just as we build the foundation uh, of this army so I've gone for, there's all sorts you can go for, uh, but I've, I've stuck with what I used to go with, and that's Solar Fury. So my emphasis on my army is firepower, sort of to clear the way. So I've gone for Mephrit, Dynasty here, which their ability is Solar Fury. So you get plus three inches to the range characteristic of range weapons. It's very useful for some of the weapons that I'm carrying in this list. Just an extra three inches uh, makes a big difference, especially to shorter range weapons like Gauls Reapers, for example. Uh, and each time model this code makes range attack, the target's unit within half range, it's an extra AP minus one. So AP minus one weapons become AP minus two at close range, and that just helps take a bite off of the opponent's armor so as well. So I found that to be particularly useful. Uh, and then when it comes to Protocol of the Vengeful Stars, uh, they get both abilities, which I guess I'll call it out now. Try and cover all the tactica here, just to give you an idea of the way the army operates, and then you can see it here and then you've got obviously the battle reports where you can see the army in action uh, here on YouTube and then over on the Plus channel as well. Uh, so they get each time model on this unit makes a ranged attack and a modified wound roll of 6, improve the AP uh, of the arm penetration attack by 1, so it's an extra AP minus 1 if you're rolling 6s, and each time model this unit makes a ranged attack that targets unit in half range, uh, you're ignoring cover as well, so it's all contrary, it's all helping you uh, with your uh, firepower. So that's the foundation building on here, trying to make my firepower have a bit more bite. And so going for uh, Mephrit Dynasty. Yeah, the same else as well, you get a specific stratagem for your dynasty. Talent for Annihilation. That uh, uses stratagem in your shooting phase, the Mephrit unit from your army is selected to shoot. Until the end of that phase, each time model on that unit makes an attack, an unmodified wound roll of a six, inflicts a mortal wound, so it's capped at three. But I found that stratagem, using that stratagem over and over and over again during games, just those mortal wounds really helping out. Again, it's tougher targets, targets of inbound saves and so on. Just means, again, just your regular infantry units just have a bit more bite with their firepower. So it's an exceptionally useful stratagem. So, very happy with Mephrit Dynasty. I just encourage you to check out the comment section. See what other Necron players are saying. You can uh, comment about this list, what units you'd add in, what units you'd take away, uh, different combinations, you can talk about unit sizes. Add. And then if you're a Necron player of experience for 9th edition, then leave your own combinations add, and army loadouts and so on uh, in the comment section below. And if you're looking for more advice, more tips, then see what other Necron players are saying in the comments section. But uh, that's the dynasty I've gone for. And then uh, we will start building up the list here. So we'll start with HQ choices. It's been very, very difficult, really hard choosing which HQs to keep in. There's so many good ones now, uh, model-wise, and also with their abilities and so on. So I've set it, I had the five, I've dropped, painfully I've dropped one, which was, was running the score pick, Lord, but he's out of the list. And uh, now I've settled on uh, four HQ choices. The structure of the army is a double patrol. Um, so it just lets me fulfill the slots that I need to, so it's two... Uh, patrols. It's going to cost me two command points to do that, so I drop to ten. I'm going to take two extra relics, it drops me down to eight, and then I play the stratagem hand of the pharaoh as well, uh, so it drops me down to six command points. Six command points is okay, plus the other five that you get automatically uh, during the game. Uh, so it's not too bad. A lot of Necron stratagems are one command point anyway, so six is not too bad a number to start with. 
So, uh, first HQ choice, no, just in the order of the book here, Luminol Zeros is in the list. So here he is, painted up, incredible model, very intricate and, and tricky to put together, especially this guy with his brain's been sucked out here. Um, but incredible model. You know, just on the basing now, I've started to add these green tufts, which I think just brings uh, this urban basing to, uh, to life a little bit, just a little bit of grass here and there. Another great thing that Games Workshop have been doing is when they've been sculpting these new models, they've been doing a bit of base work. You'll often find that on the newer sculpts, which you can incorporate into your basing work. Just really lifts and brings the whole thing alive. So very, very good work uh, that Games Workshop have been doing with that. There he is. Incredible model. Really good. So, you don't have to go for Luminol Series. You can take uh, just a regular Cryptek. You can go for one of these ones, the Technomancer, similar, if you want a cheaper option. But uh, Luminol Zeros is, is the one that I've gone for. Uh, so movement eight on him, and you'll find this model usually dead centre of the army, tucked behind Necron Warrior units, and he's there just to help out uh, as units that are nearby. Uh, with, there's lots of things that you can do to help out. So there's movement eight on him, weapon skill, ballistic skill three plus. Strength 6, toughness 6, he's got 7 wounds, and 4 attacks as base for him, leadership 10, 3 up, save. Now, one of the reasons why I take him is the useful firepower. So the Eldritch Lance is not too bad, range 36, assault d3, strength 8, minus 4, d6 damage. A number of times in games his firepower has helped out. So do like that shooting weapon, he's a character, you can hide behind your lines, you've, you've got a, a character that can fire a weapon that's almost like a tank's. Uh, size weapon uh, for him, you know, the D6 damage, uh, pretty good. Uh, living Metal and then Command Protocols, Rights of Reanimation, and in your command phase you can select one friendly Necron's core unit within six inches, I'm keeping him in the centre, there's multiple units uh, near him within six inches. One destroyed model from that unit uh, is reanimated, if the selected unit is Necron Warriors, it's D3 destroyed models instead, so he's well worth hanging around with Necron Warriors. It's restoring D3 models each time. Uh, another core unit, such as my Tomb Blades, you can resurrect a model uh, from them as well. Uh, then there's a little bit of anti psycho stuff with him for Empiric Overcharge. It's an aura ability, but it's 12 inches. I rarely don't ever use that. Uh, Atomic Energy Manipulate in the fight phase. If this model destroys one or more enemy models, then you can augment again. I uh, don't think I've ever used that either. I found the mistake I make with him is getting him into close combat. He, I think he'll do all right, and he, he just doesn't do very well. Four attacks hitting on three plus, and it's strength six minus four, two damage. Maybe just to finish a model off or something, but he's often got himself in serious trouble by getting into close combat. So the best option for him is just to, I found, is just to stay away from close combat and just get him firing his weapon every turn and augmenting and restoring models. And that's the job done for him. Um, so he gets this as mechanical augmentation. At the end of your movement phase, you can select a friendly core unit within six inches of this model. If you do, roll 1d3 and consult the table below. So uh, it's random, but they're all pretty good. Uh, until the end of the battle, you get plus one strength to characteristic to models in that unit. It's not usually very helpful for the Necron Warriors and so on. Uh, but then on a two, uh, it's plus one toughness. That is very useful. And you can put it on Tomb Blades as well. They're a core choice, you get Toughness 6 Tomb Blades, which is really good. And then the third one is plus one Ballistic Skill, so very, very useful to have that. And then the Rights of Reanimation ability uh, can be used uh, again in the turn. So you've got two units in Necron Warriors, you can restore D3 models on one and D3 models on another. So I found that's pretty good. But the, the best way I've found to use him is to stay out of trouble and just keep uh, augmenting units Firing the lance, restoring models throughout the game, and he makes his points back, uh, no problem. But as soon as he gets himself into trouble, and he's killed, and it's he's become a bit of a points sink. Now he costs 160 points. So, as I said, it's worth just protecting him and staying out of trouble, and then he'll redeem his points as as the game goes on. 
So that's him, you know, rule of cool, fantastic model, very, very, you know, visually brilliant, and has a real presence on the table. Uh, and just, I land him parking right in the center of my army, it's a real central point uh, to my units. And all, all the units sort of lead towards him. So he's in the middle and the Necron unit's spreading out, but uh, keeping that aura ability. A few units nearby. The Tomb Blades at the beginning of the game usually will park next to him. They'll get augmented and then they'll head off. Uh, if they start taking damage they can uh, have models restored and so on. So uh, that's the idea with Illuminor Xerus. So he's in. Then moving on to the second HQ choice. And really as the other units come together you'll, you'll see why these are all being taken. These HQs are uh, for Necrons is really there to help out other units uh, by a fair bit. Now this one here, the Royal Warden, is in the list. This is one of the models from the Indomitus box set. Fantastic model. Brilliant. And with this painting technique, it took me about an hour and a half to paint him, so you can get a, a pretty quick turnaround uh, for painting these models up. But the Royal Warden is in. Now he costs just 75 points, so it's a cheaper HQ choice. And I found him to be an excellent asset to this Necron Force. Uh, but yet again, it's one of those helping units that is best kept out of trouble and behind your lines and supporting your army. And the more turns he stays alive, the more times he can fire his gun and help out other units, then uh, he'll redeem his points. And I've found pretty quick. But uh, if you silly with them, get caught out, then yeah, you lose the points on them and it's, uh, you don't get to use them to their full effect. Now, one of the key elements to this army uh, is anticipating damage. So you know you're going to get shot at, you know you're going to get attacked by the opponent. You know, they've got their own units that are going to try and uh, cause damage. So the idea of this Necron army is I put certain units up front that I know are going to take damage and try and help them absorb that damage, so primarily Necron warriors, and then other units to be shielded and protected by those larger units such as these HQs and that's the way it works. So try and protect my HQs and then put out units that I know will take the damage uh, and hopefully absorb the damage and, and then uh, survive and then also protect the HQs. It's that kind of uh, combination I'm looking to do here. So the Royal Warden, uh, so he's to support the Necron Warriors uh, primarily. His toughest five, it's got four wounds uh, and then weapon skill or ballistic skill three plus what he's carrying is the Relic Gauze Blaster, so range 30, Rapid Fire 2, Strength 5, minus 2, and 2 damage. It's a pretty good weapon, but I'm going for Mephrit Dynasty, so I, this is where one of the uh, relics is added. So I give him uh, a relic called, it's for Mephrit only, it's Conduit of Stars, so he replaces the Relic Gauze Blaster, you get range 36, So, and I found this to be, this is where it becomes really effective. Range 36, you get an extra 6 inch range. Remember I'm Mephrit Dynasty, so I'm getting an extra 3 inches on top of that. So he's actually got a range 39 weapon. Pretty amazing for an infantry weapon, so 39 inch range. Um, and that means that at 19 and a half inches is your rapid fire range. And that's a, again, that's a, a real nice range to get rapid fire. If he gets to rapid fire, he goes from three shots up to six. All of a sudden, you've got a lot of shots coming from this infantry model. Uh, strength six, so you get extra strength on that relic as well. So usually he's after infantry, heavy infantry goes after, so threes to wound nearly all the time. Uh, eight minus two, which takes a nice bite off the armor, and damage two as well. So a real sort of primaris killer uh, type option with him. And again, if he's firing that weapon turn after turn after turn, He's chucking out a lot of shots, and his firepower, he often pays back his points. If he's killing Primaris models every turn, he's going to pay back that 75 points very, very quickly. So I take him, that's maybe his secondary role, is, is some supporting firepower. And sometimes he'll pick off wounds of, of Dreadnoughts, of vehicles and so on, uh, as well, no problem, if he needs to. Uh, he helps units move an extra inch, Dynasty Core units, so they get the extra inch movement. It's helpful for the Necron Warriors. Uh, living metal, and then this is the the primary reason for taking him. So remember, I'm trying to get an army that's going to move to the middle of the table. I know there's going to, the opponent's going to be there as well, so there's going to be a bit of a close combat going on, and so on. 
So adaptive strategy, in your command phase, you can select one for any dynasty core unit within nine inches of this model. So again, it's usually gonna be like this, these two paired up with all the other units nearby. So it's ready to help add a friendly core unit within nine inches. And until the end of the turn, that unit is eligible to shoot and charge in a turn in which they fell back. There's no minus two ballistic skill. You can pull back, shoot and charge uh, with that core unit. And that is tactically in a game is, is massive. Uh, it's one of the common tactics that the opponent will use is to try and tap out Necron Warrior units in close combat so to prevent their firepower. And so one of the big things you can do is take a Royal Warden uh, who can then give you the ability to pull back uh, and shoot and then even charge as well. At, and at close range, Necron Firepower is deadly. So the ability to pull out a close combat, let loose with a, you know, a fantastic volley. Uh, and if you've got uh, my will be done granted, you, all of a sudden you've got a unit that can pull back, chuck out dozens dozens of shots, that ballistic skill, two plus to hit, and then all that close range, you combine that Mephrit Dynasty, extra AP minus and so on going on, uh, you've got a very, very nasty combination indeed. But real game changer that one. And the amount of time, check out the battle reports, the amount of times in games where the adaptive strategy ability has been used, it's pulled a unit out of close combat, and, and then they've let loose of it devastating volley so very 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 helpful so I'm not sure how pop I don't think he's that popular in Necron Armies but uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't feel by Necron Army at the moment without the Royal Warden now there is something else to bear in mind yeah it's the um, protocols here there's one of these ones Yeah, it's here. Protocol the Conquering Tyrant. So Directive 2 um, here. So you, 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 you've got your card, you have these as cards, uh, or you refer to it from here, and you, you pick uh, one of these abilities for each turn. You reveal it at the start of the battle round, and that gives you abilities. And if there's a directive, you choose uh, which one you want to use. Um, so, uh, yeah, Conquering Tyrant here, so Directive number 2. This unit is eligible to shoot in the turn in which it fell back, but if it does, uh, then until the end of the turn, each time model unit you know, makes a range attack, it's minus one to hit roll. So I always bear this one in mind as well. I usually have this one lined up for turn two or turn three, where I'm expecting to find myself stuck in close combat. So there's that uh, to use as well. That could mean if you, that's helpful if you've got multiple units stuck in combat, uh, and the warden's a bit overwhelmed, you know, which unit's gonna pull back. If that's in play, then you can pull all the units back that you need to, um, so that's very, useful as well so just bear that in mind so there's two there's two ways that you can pull units out of combat and shoot and there's the protocol and also the warden uh, as well but that protocol is only going to last you for a turn the warden is with you for the whole game as long as you keep him alive so again similar to luminous this is one of the hq cho choices that i must keep alive throughout the entire game not be tempted to take risks with him just keep him safe keep him buried behind multiple units keep kicking out that firepower and then uh, pulling units out of close combat and then if, if, if these two are hanging around towards the end of the game usually the Necrons are doing well. So these are HQ choices that I want to shelter and protect and then just max out with their abilities uh, as much as possible. And the great thing if your Necron force is pushing forwards and going aggressive he'll be keeping up with them and that means he can get his relic uh, that blasts uh, the Conduit of Stars into rapid fire range doubling the number of shots uh, and a bit of extra AP- minus as well. Yeah because it's a dynasty unit so you you're going to get AP minus 3 at a rapid fire range, 19 and a half inches uh, in his case. So that's those two HQ choices. Just going through all the tactics I could think of here and just get, sort of justifying the choices for each of these uh, HQs. Maybe you'll see it more as the army's laid out. You'll see the, the way they're structured and, and buried uh, in the list. So score pick Lord was in, but he's just a little bit, just not that great. So I dropped him. And it saved me a bit of structure on the army as well. Uh, so the score pack is out. So yes, Taman Ra, the Catacomb Command Barge, which is this model over here. So here he is, this is one of the, the older models, but still a yeah, fantastic model. And there he is. And then when I built him, I magnetized him, so I do actually have a spare base. So I could put him on foot if I ever needed to, but he's, he's always seems to go in the Catacomb Command Budget. Uh, in the old, one of the old rules, 
uh, one of the old previous editions or one of the old codexes, the actual model could disembark and fight. So he had to make him so he could get out like so. But he's just magnetised his on there. And there he is. So this HQ choice is a lot more mobile uh, than the others and then go a bit more aggressive with him. But to sort of go aggressive uh, with Tamra, sort of halfway point, turn three onwards, I do want to try and protect him uh, for the early stages of the game and not be reckless and, and lose him, uh, is the idea. Uh, with him, I'll, I'll sort of cover some upgrades and things you can try and do to make him better. So movement 12, it's nice and quick. Weapon skill and ballistic skill 2+. plus. Toughest 6 is 9 wounds, lots of wounds, and he's still got that number of wounds where he can shelter behind other units, so I usually I'll, I'll keep him behind the line and he can pounce out at the right time, but early on in the game, no, the opponent can direct firepower at him and bring him down quick. 4 wounds, basic, and on him. I take the Gore's Cannon, so range 24, already range 27 from Efferit Dynasty, heavy 3, so guaranteed the 3 shots, which is really good. Uh, and then he's now a vehicle, so he's, oh, he's going to be hitting on two pluses, it's not the minus anymore for moving the vehicle. Even minus three, D3 damage, so I usually use him to pick off heavy infantry, try and chip off wounds off vehicles and so on. Uh, and then I give him uh, the war scythe, so plus two strengths, he fights at strength seven, even minus four, and two damage with him, so he's okay in close combat, not too bad. Uh, and then we'll run for his rules here. So living metal, command protocols, and then my will be done. So in your command phase, you select core unit within nine inches, and they get plus one uh, to their attacks hit roll. That's going to be in close combat and for shooting. So very very useful for blessing units like tomb blades. They're a core unit. Necron warriors, making them twos to hit is just incredible, especially if you've got larger units like units of twenty for necron warriors. Um, relentless is that plus one inches to movement for uh, core units. I don't think it's not stackable, so it's Necron Warriors will go up to six and not any more, despite if you have multiple models uh, that can give that bonus. And then Quantum Shielding, so it's got five plus invod save. In addition, each time attack is made against this model, unmodified wound roll of one to three always fails. So if your opponent starts using heavier shooting weapons or in close combat, um, it's one to three will always fail. Uh, regardless of the strength of the weapon coming through. And that all helps to keep him alive. 5 plus in one save helps. And 9 wounds is a fair bit uh, for a character. It does explode and then he hovers as well. So that's his, his basic loadout. Firepower is okay. Close combat is okay. Add, and then the my ability is pretty good. So the way I just make him a little bit better is to go for uh, a Warlord trait first of all. So I'm anticipating that he will get stuck into close combat as against a variety of targets. Sometimes a tactical, to try and charge into a vehicle, or to pin a unit down, um, or to try and wipe out a character, for example. So I give him uh, the Mephrit Wall or Trait, Merciless Tyrant. So plus one strength. So now fights at strength eight. Really helpful trying to wound vehicles and so on. Uh, or make him twos to wound you know, your average infantry. And then uh, he gets an extra attack as well. So it's an easy wall or trait, easy to remember, and uh, just, just gives him a little bit more buff in close combat. Yeah, then I pay the points for Resurrection Orb. So, uh, it's here. Once per battle in your command phase, the bearer can use this. So, the problem is, right, it's command phase, so you can't move somewhere and then use Resurrection Orb. It's the start of your turn, so his positioning is key. And that's why I want to keep him, usually keep him. Uh, behind the line, in with the battle line, uh, turns one, two, maybe three, so that he can use this resurrection up and then fly off and go and do stuff. So, um, despite his ability to move quickly and he could swing around on the flank, perhaps he needs to be near the middle of the table just to help out to let loose of that resurrection up and then maybe fly off and, and do his own thing. It, if it does, uh, you can use a resurrection up. If it does, select one for any dynasty unit within six inches. Not core units, can be a dynasty unit. So helpful for units like Necron. Uh, score pack destroyers, for example, uh, that is not at its starting strength and has not had its reanimation protocols uh, enacted this phase. This unit's reanimation protocols is enacted in every destroyed model the unit begins to reassemble. So, score pack destroyers, I've lost five models, I've got one left. I can try and resurrect the entire unit, uh, needing five pluses to reassemble models. Usually, when it goes off, it costs 30 points, 
you easily get that back. So it's well worth the investment. 30 points sounds a bit steep, but if you're resurrecting 100 points worth of models, then it's, it's well worth it. And that's often what happens. So I found the resurrection orb uh, to be exceptionally useful. And a game change. You know, you've got one score pack destroyer left, and it's towards the end of the game. All of a sudden, you've got a unit of four, because the resurrection protocol's very, very useful indeed. Uh, or you've got maybe just five Necron Warriors left out of 20, and then you play the Resurrection Orb on them, and they go up to unit of 12. It can make a huge difference in the game, especially in the middle and late stages of the battle. Uh, the downside of times when I've made mistakes with this is when he's... I've moved him off to go and do stuff, and then there's no units nearby that he can help out the Resurrection Orb. So it's, i found it's worth resisting trying to use him early in the game, and keep him in with the gun line, let other units take the damage and then he can boost them with the resurrection orb. Then after that, once it's been used, then he can go off uh, and do uh, his own thing, whatever that may be, uh, objective grabbing, clearing objectives, and so on. So that's the idea of the Katakum command barge, Tamman Ra is his name. So we'll just put him just there. So that's three of my four HQ choices. Uh, the other one's here, it's Overlord. So the Overlord that I use is the one from the, again, the Indomitus box set, which in my opinion is one of my favourite all-time 40k models. Just a brilliant, brilliant model. Really good. So really happy to be showcasing these in the in this Necron list, but uh, I love the, the Overlord model, the new plastic one uh, that came with the Indomitus box set. Uh, so, with him, another HQ choice really, it's going to be hidden in the core of my army. So you, you've I've got a real cluster of characters here that make up the nucleus of this Necron force and then everything else spreads out from them. The idea of this, this force moves to the centre of the table aggressively, they deal with whatever's in their way and then they can break out and mop up uh, as the game goes on. But so uh, the core of a very important HQ choices here. The Overlord then, uh, it's four attacks of him, it's five wounds, tough as five, weapon skill and ballistic skill two plus. Um, so all of that is good. Uh, it's, it's plus one uh, inches to move. And remember, I've got multiple HQ choices to cover my army for the protocols, because you need your HQ choices nearby to make that go off. So I've got multiple areas covering that so that as many units as possible benefit, benefiting from the uh, protocol rules. And he's got a 4 plus 7 save as well, so he's not too bad, he can stand up for himself okay. And, and then he gets my will be done, so as, again in your command phase, another core unit within 9 inches of this model. So usually it's an Ekron Warriors unit, sometimes it's the Tomb Blades that are nearby. So there's a Relic thing, there's one thing I'll just mention, usually with Tamin Ra, and I was playing it on this Overlord here, and, but to keep my HQ structure, I keep it right to the fluff, I play Hand of the Fair on, on Tamin Ra. So the My Will Be Done ability, he gets to do it twice in a turn. So that can cover my three main core units. Two new units in Ekron Warriors, and then the Tomb Blades. There is the potential in this list to bless all three of those. So two coming from him, and then one coming from the Overlord on foot. And it's those core units, and that means that they're all being pushed up to plus one to the hit rolls. Just really buffs uh, a, a huge chunk of the army. So this Overlord is, is designed again to sit in amongst uh, the units. He's a bit more close combat. Uh, Based with him, there is attack on arrow, 120 inch range, strength 12, minus 5, d6 damage. It's one use only, assault one, but there's a, a chance of causing a bit of damage with that. So uh, with him, there's one upgrade that I take, it's a, a relic. Just uh, It's a tactical choice, this one. And I find myself not using it too many times in games, but it's there if I need it, and it could be a, a big game changer. And that is, I think it's worth the, the extra command point to spend on it. It's Veil of Darkness. So once per battle in your movement phase, the bearer uh, can use this relic. So it's himself and a core unit. So usually it's going to be the Necron Warriors. Uh, it could be Tomb Blades, but it's very unlikely. It's going to be the Necron Warriors. Uh, the model and that unit can be removed from the table and then immediately deep strike in on the board. Now for Night Edition, that's a huge tactical asset to have. Um, so, some players like to use it immediately in the game, so just to shift the unit Necron Warriors up the table, as I'm more of the approach of keeping uh, the core of my army together for the first few turns, and then jumping out somewhere if I need to once as the enemy units have been uh, weakened enough to sort of broken up the opponents. 
force to some degree. So that's the overlord, he's in. Uh, points wise, pretty cheap, 100 points for him. And if he's blessing units as, and as helping out protocols, the ability to jump himself and love a unit nearby, you know, he gets his points back. And it's, it's an HQ choice with a bit of close combat ability that can move out from the battle line if needed uh, to help out in close combat. So that's the uh, the four HQ choices. It's sort of it's hard to picture what, how they're being used until you see the other units. That's what we're going to move on to next. Cover all of our HQs, and there's so many good ones to choose from now for Necrons. All these new models, new abilities. It really is a faction that's been expanded really well. We're going to troops next. So, move these HQs out of the way. Just a moment, and we'll bring in the Necron warriors. Uh, so first things for the Necron Warriors, I'd highly recommend that you max out with them. The way Command uh, or Resurrection Protocols works, so you've got uh, a unit like this, uh, you take three casualties, and then once that enemy unit's finished firing at you or attacking you in close combat, you then make your reanimation protocol rolls, which is usually a 5 plus. The Necron Warriors, you re-roll on your ones, and then you uh, resurrect however many models are restored, and then the next unit attacks them more models are slain. So it's just it's a grinding process where it's taking a, a while for your opponent uh, to eliminate that unit. Reanimation protocols will keep working until the opponent gets the wipe out. As soon as that unit's wiped out, you can't try and reanimate any of them. So the key then is to try and take as big a unit as possible so that it makes the wipe out uh, as hard as possible for the opponent to do. So smaller units get wiped out easier and you've got no resurrection ab ability for them. Larger units uh, means you can just keep resurrecting, keep restoring models as well. Luminor Zeros can restore models to play. Uh, resurrection Orb can restore models as well. So Necron Warriors you can go up to units of uh, 20. Yeah, between 10 and 20 Necron Warriors. Uh, it's, 10's okay. But my Necron Warrior units, they're the units that are going to take the brunt of the damage. So the opponent can't pick up my HQ choices usually because their characters, they hide behind the main line. But I'm going to take my Necron Warriors and they're going to take the brunt of the firepower. So small arms, firepower, heavy weapons, heavy infantry, weapons and so on being directed. These are going to be taking damage, resurrecting, taking damage and the opponent grinds them down. But uh, they do well when the opponent can't quite wipe out the unit and then I can... Uh, restore models to play, use a resurrection orb and so on and just keep those Necron Warriors alive uh, for as long as possible. So that's how you'll see them being used, just stuck at the front of the army knowing that they're just going to get uh, attacked but the idea is that they're able to absorb the attacks uh, and sort of win that firefight with the opponent. So units of 20, the configuration I've gone for because uh, with the new sculpts there's a new weapon option available for Necron Warriors which is the Gore's Reaper. So your standard Necron Warrior now, still 3 plus ballistic skill, toughness 4, 4 up save. Um, so getting them in cover is pretty good. Although, um, one of the protocols, which I, it's like a default, you put this one on turn 1. Yeah, it's the first one. Protocol of the Eternal Guardian, directive number one. Each time an attack is made against this unit, if it did not make a normal move, advance or fall back, then it gets light cover. So you stick that on turn one. So that if your opponent goes first, then you obviously haven't moved, so the whole army within range of your HQ choices gets light cover. So Necron Warriors in light cover, brilliant. Three up arms save. Just helps them out. Um, so that could be very, very helpful. So I'm running the Gauze Flayer. Uh, for half the models, so that's 10 models, range 24 or range 27, from no effort dynasty, it really, it really helps out, just the extra 3 inches, strength 4, it already comes with a bit of AP minus, AP minus 1, if I get to rapid fire range, uh, which is 13 and a half inches for me, I'd, I get AP minus 2, so that really helps out, and then you've got the Gauls Reaper, and this is where Mephrit really helps out, range 12 or range 15 for uh, Mephrit dynasty, just gives it a little bit extra range, which I've, I found it very, very helpful in games. Um, assault 2, so you don't have to get to in half range for this, you're just going to get those two shots every time. Strength 5, which is exceptionally useful against other infantry targets like Primaris Marines. 8 minus 2, uh, if I do get to in half range, um, 
which will be seven and a half inches, and it becomes AP minus three, which is ridiculous, and damage one. And you know, 10 models, that's 20 shots. So I go for a 50 50 split. So looking something like this. And these are all the new sculpts here from the Indomitus box sets. It's taken a while for this army to form up because there's been so many new models to paint. But uh, I got them cracked out pretty quickly. Necron players will tell you that they're quite straightforward to paint. You can go very ornate and intricate on them if you wish, but I've just gone for this rusty ro robotic colour scheme. It seems to have worked out really well. So there's one unit, the other unit's just over there. Uh, but look at that block, real legion look to it. So they certainly have a presence on the table for sure. So I've set up the other unit. See that block, I usually go two ranks deep, so I get a nice broad spread uh, for my army. And then my HQ choices uh, would be buried behind something like this at the start of the game. And then the legion, legion pushes forwards, so t two ranks wide. So my whip sort of out here, so a good spread across the board. Uh, and then taking casualties from the edges and then keeping my uh, models near the centre of my deployment so my HQ choices can uh, give them their buffs and bonuses, so usually working it that way. Um, and as I said, pushing aggressively with, with this army, so the Gauls Reaper is very, very useful for that. The, the closer the opponent gets to these units, the more firepower uh, will come in against them. And that Warden, that crucial unit choice uh, to help these units pull back, shoot and charge with no minuses at all. So very, very useful indeed. And then uh, models being restored of Luminal Xerus, buffing them, giving them toughness 5 or plus 1 to their ballistic skill. And then uh, the fire on abilities here might well be done, uh, giving them pluses as well. So that's what the, the HQ choice, that's their job, uh, just to try and uh, bless these Necron Warriors as much as possible and to help them out during the game. And then maxing out on their size just to be able to absorb damage and survive on the table as long as possible. So that's quite a, that's a, that's a solid core to have for your Necron army. Uh, a lot of Necron players will go for a third unit of Necron Warriors uh, just to really make a strong legion, which I can, I can see the advantage of doing that. Uh, for sure. So Necron Warriors. Um, instead of going for a third unit of those, what I have taken is Necron Immortals. So previously I was running two units of five, but again they were getting picked off because the units are too small. So I've merged them and made a unit of ten. Usually these are deployed dead centre, so they'll be in here. Or sometimes they'll be uh, behind the first rank. So it's another unit that can provide supporting firepower. So I'll just deploy them here. You know, 10, the models. And I use these to provide uh, firepower, a little bit more strength to it. Um, oh, points wise, uh, 13 points a model, so unit 20 is 260 points. So there's a lot of points being spent here, 260 and then 200, so a quarter of my points being spent on Necron Warriors. So it's worth trying to keep them alive um, as much as I can. Uh, so Immortals, these come as Toughness 5, so with the help of Luminal Zeros, as you know, they could go up to Toughness 6, they've got two attacks each. Um, and then the, I give them the Gauls Blasters, so range 30, uh, Mephrit Dynasty range 33, Strength 5, which is really good, so I've got some long range firepower at Strength 5. Uh, rapid Fire 1, so if I get them to within 16 and a half inches, um, I'm getting at two shots. And then AP minus two, or AP minus three, at close range, and damage one uh, with those. 170 points for a unit of 10 of them. So I found them useful enough. As you know, if you lose a unit Necron Warriors during the game, uh, you can start looking a bit thin on the ground. It's just a third infantry choice, just to help bolster the main battle line, I uh, found to be uh, very useful. So, not too much to say about the Immortals, They're just a, another supporting unit uh, here to, to go over the main uh, gun line. So, I've now got the core infantry units. So I've got this, this large block, I've got my HQ choices tucked in behind, just giving out all their buffs and bonuses. So they're, they're all designed to surge ahead, to march ahead, laying down a blanket of firepower. Enemy comes in towards them, just, just rinse them with firepower, pull out a close combat and shoot and so on, and just keep the march going forwards. The opponent starts to try breaking in. I've got some HQ choices that can come out and help, uh, like the Overlord, uh, Tamra, and so on. 
So building on that, we'll start to add in other units here as for the overall game plan, which is to you know, destroy the enemy, grab and hold objectives on the flanks, in the middle of the table, to repel enemy attacks, because uh, these aren't going to be able to stop everything. Opponents are maybe going to send in a lot of close combat type units, and so this line's going to need uh, some help to stop them from being overwhelmed. So there's some units to help out with that as well. But we'll do it in order here. So I've actually gone for a unit that's not that popular amongst Necron players at the moment. It's the Hexmark Destroyer. It's the last model uh, that I painted up. So here he is, just here. As far as the model's concerned, incredible, really good concept. Just this gunslinger armed with six pistols. <laughs> I really rate the model, uh, and I actually have found him to be a very useful unit to add into this Necron army as well. So useful, in fact, I'm tempted to take a second one in this list. I might be able to squeeze a second one of these in. Multiple reasons for taking it. We'll, we'll take a look at the rules and talk about how to use this. The, the hex mark destroy. So uh, hex mark destroy is actually pretty quick movement eight. The main thing here is the ballistic skill two plus, strength five, toughness five. It's got five wounds, so uh, it's durable enough. Four attack space uh, and a three up save. He's equipped with these uh, enmitic disintegrator pistols, so he's got six of them. So you're looking at range eighteen uh, with him. Pistol one. So remember, you can fire these into close combat. Because they're all pistols, you can fire all of them, so you can fire all six. Add, and then it's strength six, AP minus one, and one damage. Living metal, so if it does take wounds, he's going to restore wounds automatically at the start of the turn. Uh, and he's got dimensional translocation, so he's able to deep strike basically onto the board. So I'm taking him mainly as a tactical asset for this list. So I've got a core block of infantry. Um, I've got uh, the ability to jump with one unit and, eight, and uh, the overlord to relocate but I need other units that can reach the different corners of the battlefield and so one of the easiest ways to do that is to take deep striking units so just a single model to deep strike because most of my points are invested in the main gun line that's going to move to the middle of the table they're going to do most of the hard work but I still want something that can uh, land at, in any corner of the table so that's the idea of him uh, so he's a distracting unit to get the most out of him the choice of when when you bring him in and where you bring him in is, is key. So if you land him somewhere and he just gets blown away by some enemy firepower, then it's a waste of time taking him. So usually I'll try and bring him in at the right point where the opponent's trying to deal with too much stuff and then he turns up and the opponent's too distracted to try and go after him. If the opponent does go after him, then it's taken away from where uh, somewhere else on the battlefield the opponent needs to uh, apply their resources that they have. So. That's the idea with him, sometimes you deep strike him and just tuck him in behind some cover so that he can, only can be seen by one unit and that's usually going to be his target. Just try and uh, max out his survivability. Sometimes it might be an annoying, like an Imperial Guard Heavy Weapons team for example, tucked away somewhere with some mortars. You bring him in if you can uh, and then take them out somewhere your opponent, your army can't reach uh, by the usual means of, of movement and so on. So that's the idea uh, with him. Like, for example, I used him in a game against Adeptus Mechanicus and, and the uh, Skitari sniper teams were tucked away at the back. I brought him in and he took out two squads of those. You know, really, really good um, for picking off targets. Uh, so, there's lots of buffs going on with him. Um, he comes with inescapable deaths. Each time this model, see, his strength six is exceptionally good against toughness three light infantry. Um, so, you know, he'd, he'd murder uh, Imperial Guard Heavy Weapons teams, Skitari, you know, Admech Infantry and so on. Uh, be very good against those kind of targets. Uh, inescapable death. Each time this model makes a ranged attack, you can ignore any or, any or all hit roll and ballistic skill modifiers. It's always going to hit on two pluses. And the target doesn't receive the benefit of cover, so you can strip cover away from the opponent as well. In addition, each time this model fires Overwatch, uh, it scores hits on another fight rolls of two plus instead of sixes. So if someone does charge him, he's gonna hit on two plus with six shots. Uh, he's also re-rolling his ones in close combat and for shooting, so it's twos to hit re-rolling ones. So his firepower is exceptionally reliable. And then multi-threat eliminator, each time an enemy model, and this is why he's particularly good against lightly armed infantry. Each time an enemy model is slain by a ranged attack, um, then after the model makes the rest of its attacks, it can shoot with one of its enmetic disintegrator pistols an additional time. So, uh, he's able to kick out even more shots if he picks off 
enemy models. So again, very, very good against light targets uh, with him. So I think his firepower is fantastic. If you just pick on the right target, if you bring him in at just the right time, and then be careful about your location as well. But don't like throwing them away. Um, and you can help out with things like uh, line breaker, secondary, uh, engage in all fronts, the control of table quarters, just drop them in, and you can you can use them to harvest points. That's another way that you can use them as well. Uh, and there is, yes, I take a right gauntlet of the conflagrator for him. So this is if he deep strikes in as near multi multi-model units, and the more models the better. So it's uh, range 12, pistol 1, remember if he's deep striking you've got to be just over 9 inches away from enemy models, so range 12 is fine. Pistol 1, but each time an attack is made with this weapon that attack automatically hits, so you get an auto hit straight away. And instead of making a wound roll, well, 1d6 for each model in the target unit. So you're going after a unit of 20 conscripts, for example. You're going to roll 20 dice, and each time you roll a 6, it's a mortal wound. So I, I found that it just softens up a target it's going after, helps him to try and get that elimination uh, on that target. I remember firing at a, at a Skitari Ranger unit, it's five of them. You fired the gauntlet first, got two sixes out of five dice, and then you just picked off the rest of the models with the pistol. So it's a good, good job. Done. And, then, and that unit he picked off was uh, 65, 70 odd points, so he, he paid his points back nice and quick. So the ambush ability of him. And what I'm thinking is um, if I brought a pair of them down, they could take on tougher targets. So you unit have five Primaris Marines, for example, two of these landing uh, nearby, letting loose of all those shots. I think they would cause a lot of trouble. Yeah. Quite useful as well, and try and deep, deep strike him into cover, give him a 2 plus armor save, and he can prove quite difficult to root out. Uh, the other ability with him, I, I found if, if the opponent's deployment zone is too dangerous for him to deep strike in, it would be a waste. Uh, then uh, you can, uh, what I do sometimes is drop him in behind the main gun line, so I just tuck him in with the other characters at the back, and he can just fire those 18 inch pistols you know, for the rest of the game. Uh, sometimes just bring him in early, bring him in on turn two. Uh, and just use him that way and he can just make up the points just by letting loose of that fire pan and he's been pretty good at doing that as well. So there's different options, you can go aggressive and sneak with him, deploy him deep into the enemy lines or you can just bring him into your gun line and use him as a support that way. So Hexmark Destroyer is in the list. Then so many good choices to go for. Right let's go for these guys here. Scorpex Destroyers. Uh, it's again, one of the new sculpts and games workshop that came out with the Indomitus box set. One of my all-time favourite units, the Necrons. An utterly deadly in close combat. They're a brutal unit in close combat, so they are in. Uh, so I have to take. I think you just have to take some take units of five, just because they're worried about blast weapons and so on. Uh, but I've found that unit of six is the way to go. Your opponent knows these are good and so they will be shot at. <laughs> so I try and max them out in size. And I run a plasma site with them as well. So we'll just tuck them in at the back. So this is purely close combat, this unit. They're not core, uh, but they can be helped out by resurrection orbs, which can prove very, very useful. Um, usually I'll run these they can go wherever you want them to go, but usually I'll run them behind the main gun line, tucked away, and use them as a counter punch unit when your opponent gets close to your line. So your opponent's moving in, they start to engage uh, with your units, and then bring in the score pack destroyers. They move eight and get there in close combat, and they can usually destroy anything they make contact with. So that's the idea of the score pack destroyers. Um, now they're moving eight, so they're actually pretty quick on foot. Weapon skill, business skill, three plus. Strength 5, Toughness 5, nice and durable, 3 wounds as well, so really durable against small arms, firepower, 3 attack space, which is excellent, uh, leadership 10, and 3 up, save for them. So, uh, it's Hexmark Destroyer, by the way, 75 points, just to cover his points, 6 Scorpec Destroyers is 210 uh, for them, Plasma Sight is 15 points, so very, very cheap indeed, you can just add him in, he has to stick around, hang around with them, and he's sort of a disposable unit, just need him for the first time in these charge, I need that plasma site nearby, 
uh, and it's well worth doing, especially on a large unit of school pack destroyers. Um, so, uh, they come with, yep, yeah, so one in three models comes with the hyperphase thresher. So it's strength of the user, AP minus, so it's the reap blade, sorry, hyperphase reap blade, one in three models comes with that. It's the larger sort of two-handed blade there. Uh, you get plus two strengths, fighting at strength seven. It's AP minus four, which is deadly, and then straight three damage, which is fantastic. So that's a brilliant weapon. There's no minus to hit rolls for that. Uh, and then the rest of the models, two out of every three, come with the hyperphase threshers. So strength fuse, which is strength five, AP minus three, two damage. They're all primaris killers. They're utterly deadly. They get an extra attack as well, so you get four attacks on top of that as well. They get an inbuilt uh, hardwired for destruction. So you're rerolling your hit rolls of ones. So threes to hit, rerolling ones. Nice and reliable. Lots of attacks uh, with them. There is a stratagem, actually. I can't remember what it's called. You'll find it in there. Um, it only costs you one command point. Whirling Onslaught, I think it's called. Uh, one command point. When your opponent you know is going to go after them, either in shooting or in close combat, it's minus one to the wound rolls. And I found that's been really helpful to try and keep them alive. You know, your opponent's fighting you at strength four, needing fives to wound. You play that stress all of a sudden at sixes to wound. Makes it very, very difficult to target them um, and wipe them out. So the plasma site then, it's just 15 points. Um, I keep him nearby and he can bless them. Infused Madness, once per turn at the start of e either your charge phase or the fight phase. So you can either bless them just before you charge, and, or if he's nearby, you can bless, you, bless them just before uh, they fight. So just don't get caught out, don't forget. Remember to bless them, I usually try to try remember to bless them before they go in, before I roll up for my charge, and use this ability on them. You can select one friendly destroyer cult unit in three inches, it's, it's, that's the problem. You charge early and then all of a sudden the plasma site's out of range and uh, it can make things uh, awkward so make sure that power goes off in three inches. Roll a dice on a one, model that unit is destroyed regardless of the results, even if you do lose a model on a one, uh, then it's plus one strength and an extra attack on top of that as well. So now your units again, four attacks with the reap blade, five attacks with the freshers and a large unit. It's so worth it, just all the tons of extra attacks, brilliant. And the extra strength, you're now fighting at strength 6 with the Threshers, and crucially strength 8 with the Reap Blade. Very useful against tougher targets, like toughness 7, toughness 8, uh, for example. So very much rate the Plasma Site. I think it's well worth it just to give that unit more impact when it charges in. So you charge that into a vehicle, a monster, adds heavy infantry, light infantry, anything. They will chop their way through any target. Score pack destroyers. Fantastic unit to take. I found them best if you run them straight out, like go aggressive and just run them up the table. You can't see them, shoot them, and reduce them down. Uh, but I found that by tucking them, hiding them away, and then bringing them out, turn two, three, four, especially to help out the gun line if it finds itself stuck in close combat, or well, there's an enemy threat moving up, swing them in and use them as a counter punch unit. So usually maintain sort of the centre part of the table, add, and then add. Once they've repelled that unit, they can go back in again, or usually they just keep pressing on, charging into other targets. Or I've used them aggressively other times, I partner them up with Team Blades, Tam and Ra will go with them, and then they'll push up the table aggressively and try and break through enemy lines at an early stage of the game. So there's different ways to use them, but close combat is the ultimate aim at, with the score pack destroyers. So, moving on. So many good choices. The, the Void Dragon is very good, but he's not in the list here. Scarabs are a very good choice. What I've gone for is Tomb Blades, and I'm not sure how popular these are um, with Necron players, but I rate them as one of the key units for this army, just the configuration that I go for. So we'll bring the models in. Yep, so there's two. Exceptionally useful unit, this one. But I found there's a way to use them to get the most effect from these. Again, just check out the battle reports, see them being used, and the times of the Necrons when you'll, you'll see the tactics I'm talking about being actually used at in game here. So, Tomb Blades, you can take up three to nine. I've gone for six. Smaller units, I used to run two units of three, but again, they just get wiped out too quick. Um, so, I've merged them into a unit of six, and they're much more durable. Because uh, as long as your opponent doesn't get the wipeout, 
add, and that's good for Necron units. Right, movement 14, so nice and quick. You can advance on top of that as well. Blissed skill 3 plus. This, the toughness 5 and 2 wounds. So, durable enough. Add. Now, there's a built in minus 1 to the hit rolls against them. The ranged attacks, so that will help them as well. Uh, they've got living metal and so on. They benefit from all the command protocols. And crucially, they're core units. They can be uh, blessed by. Uh, might well be done, for example. They can be augmented by Luminor Zero. So usually I park them near the centre of the table again, just tucked at the back, uh, ready to be blessed before they fly off uh, for firepower. Now, the configuration I've gone for with these is. Uh, it's 168 points, 198 points. So I've gone for plus shield veins, plus one armor save, so three up armor save, and I also uh, paid uh, for shadow loom, which is the five plus invun save as well, because often the opponent will target them with heavier weapons. Uh, so the five plus invun save, very, very uh, useful. So that just makes them tougher and a bit more durable, because the key is to try and keep them alive. Uh, and then the shooting option I've gone for with these is the particle beamer. So range 18, or in my case range 21, so again a short range weapon is a little bit more range being added on, so 21 inch range, uh, assault 6. So unit 6 is kicking out 36 shots. It's a blistering amount of firepower. You can pair that with a twin gauze blaster, 2 shots, or if you have to get them in rapid fire range, 4 shots, but guaranteed 6 shots at any range is a fantastic amount of firepower. Strength 5, there's no AP minus, but if I do get to in half inch range, uh, I'll get the AP minus one and one damage. But the idea is just to saturate the opponent with just uh, tons and tons of shots coming through, and it just whatever their armor save is, it just overwhelms. There's so many dice to roll up, it just it just chips the wounds off. Uh, is the idea of that? There's the Mephrit Dynasty stratagem, causing mortal wounds. Very effective with these because you've got so many shots, you're almost guaranteed to get those six, uh, those three mortal wounds coming through on top of your damage as well. So good combination to use uh, with that. So with these, they do move quick, but usually I'll park them in the centre of the table, uh, get them augmented, plus onto their uh, hit rolls, and then I usually hold them back. I don't want this unit being, I want the opponent being forced to fire at the Necron Warriors, is pretty much all they can see. Try and tuck away the Scorpec Destroyers, tuck away the uh, Tomb Blades, just keep them out of trouble. Don't want them getting blown away on turn one, uh, and then bring them out as uh, turn two onwards uh, and they're a large unit they can take damage and just to provide firepower support uh, wherever it's needed along the battle line so if the opponent's breaking on the right hand flank you can zoom these across at uh, 14 inches and then just lay down that blanket of firepower so they're good for ganging up against enemy targets and just to help out with that saturation of firepower so you can use them to support the main line or i can swing them out on the flank they can support the scorpec destroyers as they move up the table there's all sorts of uses uh, for the team blades but the golden key with them i found is just not to expose them too much in the early stages of the game and, and if they get wiped out you, you've lost uh, a very useful uh, unit that can support with lots of firepower now if you can keep these alive towards the end of the game they're chucking out that firepower constantly 36 shots every turn uh, then they're going to cause trouble for sure so that's the idea with the team blades a mobile firepower unit to help support the gun line just provide firepower support across the board the Necrons. So, let's give you an idea of the shape of the army. Yeah, so onto heavy support. I've got two heavy supports now, so finish off the list. So, again, not a popular choice, these, but they seem to work well, and I'm just a, a big fan of the model. So, it's the Canoptic Doomstalker here. It's huge. I'll show you the height of this thing. There it is. Massive model. I love the sort of the War of the Worlds theme going on with this thing. So, so impressed. I know it's controversial, I've taken two, I've got two of them. There they are. Yeah, visually on the board, they're, they're fantastic. So, well, I'll, I'll explain my reasons for taking these, uh, despite them not being the most popular choice uh, for Necron players. So, the Doomstalker then, we'll run through the stats, and then I'll talk about the reason why I've taken them. Um, so, the movement 10, they can actually move quite quick if they need to. Uh, there, it's a strange thing here. The weapon skill is four plus, which degrades with damage. But I'm not interested in that. It's the it's the ballistic skill. No matter what damage they take, it remains at four plus. So four plus isn't great, but it's consistent. Whatever wounds remain, which is very good. Toughness six, got twelve wounds, three attacks, and a three up save. 
Now, they're actually quite hard to bring down because there's 12 wounds to try and get through. And they have this 4 plus Invon save, so your opponent can end up firing a lot of stuff to try and bring one of these things down. They're cheap, 140 points. I think they look a lot more than what they actually are. It's a 140 point unit. They do explode. Uh, there's the, you get overwatch with them so they can help protect the gun line and get to shoot for free with that. Um, so, the idea of these is that the, they're a, a unit that I deliberately put out there for the opponent to shoot at. And if the opponent ignores them, then they'll just fire every turn and they can cause trouble. If the opponent shoots them, goes after them, then he's not firing at other parts of the army. So the idea of these is that they distract the opponent and they are a big distraction. They're a big presence on the table. This huge thing sitting there. The opponent knows that he needs to bring this thing down and then by doing so they can end up uh, using a lot of their firepower to do so. They're actually trying to bring down a cheap unit and it's a unit that I'm not actually relying upon in the game. I take the firepower that comes from these things just as a bonus but I try not to rely upon it like I need you know like I need these two models to destroy this tank. I try not to think like that actually try and grind the wounds down uh, with these other units and then just take any results from these as a bonus and therefore I don't lean on them too much and then I'm not too worried if they do get if and when they do get broken down there's two of them now in the list so it's quite hard to eliminate both of them uh, if they're in range of HQ choices they will get uh, the benefit of cover and their weapon the doomsday blaster is can be terrifyingly good it's high power if you sit still it's range 48 or range 51 in my case heavy d6 so yes it is very random you could get one shot but you could also get six shots uh, it's hitting on four so if sometimes in games you'll get four hits and all of a sudden there's trouble for that target because it's strength 10 minus five and d6 damage it's a blast weapon as well uh, and then if you do move, you fire at low power, which is range 24, range 27, heavy d6, strength 8, minus 2, d3 damage, and blast for that as well. So, um, if the opponent ignores these, it can come at a cost, because their firepower can be deadly against tougher targets, uh, like tanks and so on. If the opponent goes after them, then uh, they prove to be, I've found to be a very, very good distraction. And even if they're sitting there with just one wound left, they're still firing at 4+. plus. I usually stick them out on the flanks uh, to protect the flanks. Uh, if the opponent tries to charge on the flank, they have to try and deal with these things instead of contacting my infantry units. Often you'll find they're just strung out uh, on flanks. Usually um, I'll use them as well for holding on to objectives. It's another great thing just to have them out uh, on objectives as well. But I just, it just adds a nice bit of height, a bit of firepower, a bit of presence on the board for these things. It's cheap, firepower, 140 points. Uh, this isn't too bad and they, they can contribute very very well uh, in the game and I found that for each turn that goes by these things remain alive their, their firepower just just keep kicking out that d6 shots uh, with them can be very useful indeed so that's the reasons for taking the Doomstalker just sort of a, a bonus unit to add in uh, and a cheap distraction unit for your opponent to try and deal with I know other players will try and maybe uh, pair them up or take three of them then take a crypt tech, give them plus one to hit rolls and so on, but that's where you're trying to go down the route of relying on their firepower. Uh, but I know their firepower is not reliable, d6 shots isn't reliable, and so I just stick them out on the flanks and just take any bonus that comes from them uh, and play them that way. And when the opponent starts shooting at them, and I frustrate them by keep rolling four plus in one saves, then I think, yep, yeah, the, plan, <laughs> the plan's working. He's firing at those, and rather than fire at the Doomstalkers, then at targets like my Scorpec Destroyers, or Tomb Blades, they're units that I do want to try and keep alive. And so if the opponent's distracted by the, the Doomstalkers, then that, that plan is working well. That's the list then for the Necrons. I've covered all the units, talked about tactics. I'll assemble the army here, and then we'll, we'll zoom out and take a look at the list. All right, so that's the Necron army laid out uh, for you, just to give an idea of, of how the force looks. You, you took two core units of Necron warriors. Uh, another uh, infantry choice here, the Immortals, just to provide support. So that makes up the bulk of my line. And then to aggressively move forwards, just laying down that blanket of firepower. And just to help them out, uh, Luminor Zerus to remain buried in amongst those core units during the game. Along with the Warden as well, helping units pull out close combat. Uh, then uh, another uh, buffing unit here, it's the Overlord. He's to go with them, a bit of close combat ability of him. Then Tamim Ra uh, to hang around with these units at the start of the game and then move out uh, aggressively later on. 
Five power support coming in from the two Canoptic Doomstalkers. Just bonus five power coming from them. Obviously to go after sort of heavier targets. And then my more mobile units, the Tomb Blades, to provide five power support along the line wherever it's needed, or to move out aggressively and go after targets. And the Scorpec Destroyers, which I usually play uh, as a counterpunch unit. That the, the front line of where I'm pushing into the, the opponent's deployment zone in the middle of the table is actually going to be units like the Necron Warriors and these to act as a counterpunch reserve. Other times I may use them aggressively and, and move them up the table straight away. And then I've got my Deep Striker here to land as a tactical asset on the table. Either, again, either to support the main line or to ambush uh, somewhere else on the table. But that's the list for the Necrons. Uh, leave your own comments and feedback, what units you agree with, which units you don't. Uh, make your predictions about the list, how well you think it will do. Could they win uh, the league? Uh, I hope they will have been doing well so far. We'll see uh, how they cope against other uh, armies as they come up against them. Uh, and then leave your own suggestions. What units you take for your Necron army and why. Uh, if you do use elements of this army or you can copy the list entirely, let us know how you get on in the comments section below. Give a report of, of how you've performed uh, in different battles. But that is the complete army overview for the Necrons. 2000 points, 9th edition with the new codex. Keep a lookout for new uh, complete army videos uh, as the forces are put together and I'm hoping to do a top five units for the Necrons as well. I uh, had a video coming up uh, hopefully with this one so you can check that out as well. But that's the, the army. Thanks for watching and tune in next time.